Well, good morning. Jonah chapter 2 verse 2 in the New Living Translation says, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble and he answered me. Have you been crying? Are you talking to God about your great trouble? Is your faith rising? Are you sensing a shift in the atmosphere? Are you convinced yet that change is coming to your house? Are you aware that God is about to answer you? Your trial is about to be over. You are coming out and you are coming out more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Good morning, my name is Pastor Amy and I have the privilege of coming to you again this morning. We have been studying five strategies that you can apply to get a breakthrough. There's prayer, worship, fasting, brokenness, and giving. Today, we're gonna look at the results of applying in these strategies. What happens when God draws near? Isaiah is a prophet of God whose main responsibility was to give God's people his messages and point out the people's sins so they could repent and be pleasing before God again. Here in Isaiah chapter 58, the children of Israel were crying out to God, wanting God to answer them, but God was silent. So God begins to speak to his servant Isaiah. Now the first five verses we're going to find out why God's upset. And then he's going to tell them, look, you're doing it all wrong. And then we're going to get to verse six and he's going to show you the results. And when you do it all right. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 58 verse one, God speaks to Isaiah and he says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. He said, Isaiah, I have a message I want you to deliver to my people. I want you to preach and I don't want you to cut any corners. I want you to tell them the truth and I want you to tell them the whole truth. He said, cause I need you to show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. So God is about to tell Isaiah what the problem is and why he has been so quiet. Verse two, God tells Isaiah, they seek me daily. Now he's talking about the children of Israel. They seek him daily. That word seek right there means to seek God through prayer and worship. Well, that doesn't sound like anything going wrong, right? But notice that's one that's two of our strategies that we've been discussing, prayer and worship. He says, they seek me through prayer and worship daily, and they delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinances of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Well, properly interpret it, that what that really means, in other words, they pray and they worship me every day as if they want to know my ways and as if they were righteous and genuinely seeking God. And they want me to come and fight their battles and give them justice, pretending that they want to draw near to me. So here you see that really they were just coming to God in prayer because they had gotten in trouble and they needed God to deliver them. And they had no desire to chase after God, to seek after him, to get to know him. Really, they were just looking as a God, as, you know, God as, as a lifesaver. It's just somebody come and, you know, rescue me when I get in trouble. If you really want to draw near to God and want God to draw near to you, then sin has to go. Remember in verse one, God said, I need you to talk to them because they're sinning. They were applying these five strategies, but it wasn't working for them because they needed to fix some things first. Verse three, the people uh, begin to tell God, wherefore have we fasted and you don't see it? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul 
or we have made ourselves broken before you. There's our third strategy. And that you take no knowledge. Behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure. Let me back up. He says, wherefore have we fasted? They're saying, you know, God, we're fasting and you're acting like you don't even see us. Here we are afflicting our soul and breaking before you and you act like you don't even know what's going on. And God said, I'll tell you why I ain't responding to you. He said, behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure. He said, give me a break, guys. I'm God. He says, I know why you're fasting. You're fasting because you want your prayer answered. You don't want to draw near to me. And you're just doing this to make yourself feel good like you did some spiritual act that's going to win you some special favor. And he says, and you exact all your labors. He says, you put burdens on your employees. You put burdens on on your staff and your coworkers. Man, when you are fasting, we need to have a pure heart when we come before God. And when we fast, man, we don't need to put extra burdens on people if we are in charge, if we're in management positions or we have people under us working for us. The Bible says that's not the time for you to put burdens on them. He said, you fast, verse four, for strife and debate and smite with the fist of wickedness. He said, every time you come before me fasting and praying and worshiping and being broken, what you say you are, he said, you're quarreling, you are arguing, you are fighting while you are fasting. You have got to be careful and you have got to guard your spirit. You have to recognize the enemy because the enemy is very tricky. You know, sometimes, you know, out fighting and arguing is not because we're argument of people, but sometimes the enemy comes in because he knows you are fasting and he knows you are seeking God. And we have to be wise and we have to recognize this is the devil attacking us to try to distract us from what God wants to do in our life. So when you fast, when you seek God, when you pray, when you worship, when you come in his presence broken before him, you need to leave all quarreling, arguing, and fighting aside. He said, you shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Man, you can't make God listen to you. This isn't how we approach God not with sin in our hearts, demanding that God answer us. And that's what the, these people were doing. God said in verse five, is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will thou call this a fast and an acceptable day of the Lord? See, in the Old Testament, when a person fasted, they would put on clothes made of rough burlap. They would put ashes on their heads and they would sit on a pile of ashes. It was an act that was supposed to remind them to remain humble when approaching God. But here God was saying that what they were doing was unacceptable because they were only going through the motions. We've all been guilty of that one. We've all, you know, dried up in some area and walk in our Lord and you just find yourself going through the motions. He said, your outward appearance seemed as if you were seeking God, but inwardly your hearts and your minds were far from him. Matthew 23, 25 says, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of your cup and of the platter, but inside you are full of filth. You rob and you have no self-control, you're greedy. So when we fast and when we come into his presence, we need to have a pure heart before God. We need to apply the five strategies, but we got to make sure that we're not fighting. We're not bickering. We're not arguing. Our motive is correct. Um, we, we make sure we really are trying to get close to God. It's fine if you want him to answer your prayer, but make sure that you're, you're going about it the right way and you're not doing it the wrong way. And here they were doing it the wrong way. So Isaiah 58, uh, one through five tells us what not to do. 
So let's look at verse 6, because in verse 6, starts by telling us the right way to fast. Verse 6 says, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Now this verse right here has a double meaning. First of all, it focuses on your own personal life because he was telling them, I need you guys to repent. I need you guys to get right with me, right? But every time somebody fasts doesn't mean they have sin in their heart and something's wrong with them. Sometimes we are right with God, but we got to press in a little harder. So this is a double meaning. So the other meaning for this is that we need when we fast and when we see god we need to focus on other people's deliverance so for some of you you're going to need to repent and get things right with god that you know you're not doing right hebrews 12 1 says let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us but for some of you you are in right standing with god so when you fast don't forget that God has commanded us to be a witness for him. You need to take this time that you're spending in his presence and you need to pray for others people's deliverance. You have family, you have friends, you have coworkers, you have neighbors that you need to allow God to burden your heart and begin to press in for their deliverance. You know, when we want God to deliver us, sometimes we get so focused on ourselves that, that we forget that God, you know, sometimes just wants us to take our mind off of ourselves, off of our problems, and put our mind on God's heartbeat. And we know God's heartbeat is the salvation of souls. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is God's heartbeat. And so when you begin to pray for others, when you begin to pray for your family to get delivered, now you took your mind off of you and your problems, and you have put your mind on God and his heartbeat and what brings pleasure to him. And this pleases God. Remember Christ fasted 40 days in the wilderness being tempted of the devil and when he overcame he went to church he opened up the scriptures and he said in Luke chapter 4 verses 18 and 19 he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Doesn't this sound exactly like Isaiah 58? Let's look at verse 7. The next thing God requires us to do, he says, is it not to deal or give your bread to the hungry? I bet you thought I forgot about that fifth strategy, but I haven't. That fifth strategy is God expects us to give when we fast. He says, when you fast, when you come before me, you need to give to the hungry. Man, go find somebody who's homeless, buy them a sandwich. Go minister to that um single parent who's in your church who's struggling and could use some help with groceries. If you say, Pastor Amy, I am that struggling mom. You can do something. Give an apple to a homeless man. Just, just do anything. Just find something you can do to give while you're fasting. Now, you don't have to do every one of these things he mentions when you fast, but make sure however God leads you, however... God is dealing with you that in that period of time of you seeking God and worshiping and praying and being broken before him that you don't forget to give. He says, is it not to give your bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to your house? Give the poor shelter. Now in this generation, I don't suggest you take people in that you do not know, but if you see somebody homeless and, and maybe they just need some bus money to make it to the homeless shelter, 
You know, you can do something little, you can do something small, you can find a way to help somebody. Maybe you can make some phone calls for someone who's just stressed out and can't find a house. He says, when you see the naked, cover him. Go through your closet, find some clothes that you don't want anymore, that you don't use. And I'm not talking trash, like please don't give away you know, your worst clothes to God. We are giving this to God because when we lend to the poor, we lend to the Lord and God will repay him. So if you want God to repay you and bless you, then, then, you know, do right. Give God something nice. But if you have stuff that you have extra things, then go give some clothes to the poor. If you have the money, go buy some. Buy that little girl in Sunday school her, who her mom is struggling and she would like a pretty dress like all the other girls. Just go do something nice for them. It says, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. That means do not hide from your family when they need money. Don't look down on your family members who are struggling and don't just not help someone because they squander money. And that's the real test right there because all of us are thinking, man, they always coming for money. But you know what? If they really need help, it's the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. What they do, they have to stand before God. But you got to stand before God. And maybe your acts of kindness over the years is what's going to help woo them and bring them into the body of Christ. So if they really need help, use wisdom. I'm not saying throw your money away. Use wisdom and find a way to do it where they're not taking advantage of you and help them. The Bible says in verse 8, then that word is so important then 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 means after you do all these things we just talked about then shall your light break forth as the morning then you will get a breakthrough and your health shall spring forth speedily. God will heal you quickly. If you've been suffering from cancer for a long time, then apply these principles, do what God says to do, and God will give you the victory over your health. And your righteousness shall go before thee. Righteousness means to be in right standing with God or to be accepted by God. Well, what righteousness is Isaiah talking about? What, what righteousness will go before you? Everything he just finished telling you to do. If you pray, if you worship, if you are broken, if you give, if you fast, he said your righteousness will go before you. If you repent of your sins, if you obey God and preach in the gospel, and if you give, he says, the glory of the Lord shall be your reward, which means God is going to have your back. The enemy is not going to be able to come up and sneak an attack on you anymore. He will protect you. Not that he won't try. He's always attacking us. He's always throwing something at us. But we know how to get the victory. Remember the story with Moses and the children of Israel at the Red Sea? And God was leading them out of the wilderness finally. Finally, they're coming out of slavery. Finally, they're getting victory. They've been in bondage for over four. 400 years and after Pharaoh let them go he changes his mind and he says I'm coming back and I'm putting them back into slavery Exodus 14 verse 19 says remember how the pillar the cloud would uh, lead them by day and a pillar of fire by night and the Bible says in verse 19 and the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel removed from being in the front 
and went behind them. What did God just say? If you fast, if you seek me, if you pray, if you worship, he said, the glory of the Lord will be behind you. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. So now the presence of God is standing in between you and the enemy and where you were vulnerable, where your back was turned, where the enemy thought he had the vantage point. Now he thought he was going to put that arrow in your back. Now he's about to run into the living God. He's about to come to a full stop because God is going to be your real reward. Verse nine says, and then shalt thou call and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry and he shall say, here am I. I now God has finally drawn near he isn't silent anymore now the heavens are opened over you and you can feel the presence of God so if you take away from the midst of you the yoke the putting forth of your finger if you quit blaming if you quit speaking vanity evil wickedness and mischief and if you draw out your soul to the hungry and say satisfy the afflicted soul. Now you're going to be able to minister to others. You're going to be able to help others draw near to him. You're going to be able to pour out the revelation that God has given to you. Then shall your light rise in obscurity and your darkness shall be as a noon day. That dark cloud that has been hovering over you will break and you will be surrounded with the light of God. Verse 11, and the Lord shall guide thee continually. You will always get direction from his word. You will never be lost. You will never be confused. God will always speak to you and lead you on the correct path that you should go. And he will satisfy your soul in drought. When others are drying up for lack of revelation, you will be filled with the word of God. And he will make fat your bones. You will be healthy. You will be whole and you will be healed. And thou shalt be like a water garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Remember the woman at the well that Jesus said in John chapter four, verses 14, when God revealed to us that he is the living water, Jesus told her, but to whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never, never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Second Corinthians chapter six, verses 16 says, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Verse 12, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. You don't have to worry about your children when you get in the presence of God. God will raise up your children and your grandchildren, and they will go back to those very churches and cities that used to have a move of God, and they will bring revival to their generation. And thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. God is going to use you to mend broken hearts. He will use you to restore marriages. He will use you to unite broken families. You will be the restorer of paths to dwell in. You will be able to witness to people and bring backslidden, bring people back to God. Those family members, they have to get saved. That husband, he has to come home to God. That wife, she has to come home. Those wayward children, they have to come back to God. When you apply these strategies and you do what God is asking you to do. Verse 13, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, the Sabbath is a day that we set aside to seek God and we call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable. That means you need to enjoy your time with God on Sunday and you need to honor him. The Bible says, and you shall 
honor him not doing your own ways, which means Sunday is not for you to be watching a bunch of football and having a bunch of barbecues and picnics and doing whatever it is you want to do. God wants us to continually every week, every Sabbath, every Sunday to come before him and honor him and spend time with him. He says, if you honor me, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, which means you're not going to talk idly. You're not going to talk foolishly. He says, then thou shalt delight yourself in the Lord. We know Psalms 37 verse four says, delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. God is going to answer your prayer then. God will answer your prayer after you fast, after you worship, after you break before him, after you seek him, after you, you give and you follow these strategies and you get deep into his presence and you, you cleanse your heart of any sin and you begin to focus on God and what's important to him and his heartbeat. And when you do that, he says, I'll give you the desires of your heart because you delighted yourself in me. And he says in verse 14, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. He said, now we're going into the deep things of God. Now I'm going to take you into higher realms in the spirit. Now you will enter into a presence of God that you have never experienced before. And he said, then I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. Now every promise that God has given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and whatever other promise you can find in that Bible will be be yours to claim for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Somebody just needs to shout. Somebody just give God some praise. Look what God will do for you when you apply his principles, when you follow his steps, God will answer you. He will answer that cry. If this message has been a blessing to you, we would like for you to sow into the ministry. We are asking you to support this ministry because you are sowing to the gospel. You are sowing to Jesus Christ. We want this message to keep going. If you'd like to give, give to seanpender.net forward slash give, or you can give to PayPal at paypal.me forward slash seanpenderministries, or you can give by mail, Sean Pender Ministries, P.O. Box 117-442, Carrollton, Texas, 750-117-442. Thank you for joining me this morning. If this has been a blessing, subscribe to our channel. Know me and Pastor Sean love you. And if you would like for me to continue with just one more message, I can come again to you tomorrow to show you from the book of Acts of one man who applied these strategies and had a phenomenal supernatural experience with God. God bless you. Have a great day. We'll see you again tomorrow.